heel as a team, we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen, believe me. And we can stay here, get the shish kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back, way back, way back into the light. Into the light, into the light. We can climb out of hell, out of hell, out of hell. One inch at a time. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from. I mean, that's that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's just game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're going to see a guy you're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it you're gonna do the same for him that's the team gentlemen and either we heal now as a team or we will die as individual 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 Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. It is another live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. Today is January 15th, 2012. I'm your host, Popeye from federaljack.com, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Today, I have a special guest. He is uh, not only a very well trained individual when it comes to uh, risk assessment and emergency management. I'm, I'm going to read you his his little uh, blurb just about his training alone. Okay, but he knows what's up with the New World Order. Okay, and he's an author. I want to say a researcher, and he's a listener not only to my show but to Orion Talk Radio. So it, I wanted to bring him on and get him uh, not only a little spotlight as an author, but I wanted uh, him to be able to get his voice and opinion on the airwaves for everybody to hear because I respect what he has to say. Let me read you a little blurb about my guest. His name is Chris Tyson. He received a BA in criminology from the University of Florida. He's taken training courses in emergency management and risk assessment from the Department of Homeland Security, Energetic Materials Research and Testing Center, FEMA, the National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center, and the Office of State and Local Government Coordination Preparedness. He's a past member of the American Society for in- Industrial Security, and for nearly a decade, Chris has worked in the private sector as a security manager. In the retail industry, he worked as a loss prevention manager before moving into the hospitality industry as a certified lodging security director. So obviously, you could see He's got training not only uh, – he works in the public sector, but he's got training in, from government in risk assessment, emergency management, which are real things. I, when I was a firefighter, I was involved in uh, emergency management, and I worked for the emergency management uh, office in the town that I lived in. It was all voluntary basis, obviously. We didn't get paid, but that was part of my position. I worked for OEM, we called it. Anyway, 
without further ado, I want to bring Chris on and introduce him to you all and, you know, let you guys introduce, uh, you know, like let him introduce himself to you guys and uh, tell you guys a little bit about himself. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening. And I really appreciate, you know, the fact that not only did you, you've had all this training, so you've been through, you know, what I like to call brainwashing ink. That's what I call government training because I went through it myself, so I understand. But you've been through brainwashing ink and you've still come out with a, a complete clear head on your shoulders and you understand what's up with the New World Order. And because you have a degree in criminology, you understand the law as well. So it's good to have someone that has, you know what I mean? You, you kind of, it, it's not like, they can say, and when I say they, I mean the um, establishment, media, whoever, any critics could say, oh, well, this guy's just some schmuck idiot in his parents' basement. No, obviously you're not. That's why I read off that, that little blurb about you because obviously you uh, – you know what I mean? You're not just some average person. You're not just some average guy you know, sitting in you – know, maybe 15-, 16-year-old kid sitting in a basement making up stuff and putting it on the internet. You're you know, a real – uh, accomplished individual and here you are saying the same things that we are so i just want to give you a big thank you for having the courage because you know coming out and especially you know being trained in emergency management and being in that field it's not easy to you know talk about what you talk about and and be open about it so i i, I give you a big thanks and thank you for writing your book ladies and gentlemen you have to check out his book and chris i'm going to give you the floor tell the listeners about yourself and then, um, you know, we have the whole first hour. We'll go into your book and everything. So for we have about, about six minutes left in the segment here. So I'll just give you the floor and tell the listeners all about yourself and what got you in to this. Like, when did you wake up? When, was your, when, when did you find the key to your door and you saw everything that was going on? Well, thanks again for the compliment and uh, thanks for having me on your show. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing, too, trying to expose all this to the public. Uh, my training, uh, as you read off, I, I spent many years in the private sector uh, working hand-in-hand -hand with the public sector. I worked with many agencies alongside of me in my job. As a security director for a large hotel corporation, uh, you have to rub shoulders with all kinds of federal agencies every day. Uh, the, you know, you're talking the DEA, the ATF, the CIA. I rub shoulders with all these guys, as well as your local law enforcement, sheriff's office, and fire departments. Uh, the training uh, I was required, they actually encouraged me to take a lot of that training you listed off because um, under 9-11, after 9-11, I was considered a soft target. Um, under the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, which is under the Homeland Security Department, you can actually go look at it on their website, there's 18 specific sectors, and I'm under the commercial sector. And inside the commercial sector, there's eight subsectors, and I'm in that subsector under lodging which is hotels, motels, and conference centers. Like for each sector, another subsector would be like uh, stadiums for football games and banking centers like bank branch, private bank branch branches. But I'm under the lodging sector, so I was encouraged to go take courses that were actually uh, way above my pay grade would be a good way of saying it. I was in, in the classroom with fire chiefs, uh, public health uh, chiefs for that county, your chief public health information officer, I was in, in classes with the sheriff, the, the actual sheriff of the county would be in the classroom with the under sheriff. So I was in classes that were very enlightening as to where this is all going. And a lot of the training I got from these classes was on the bird flu, the strain of the flu, the H1N1 virus. I also got a lot of training on target hardening, which is a hotel and like a shopping mall is considered a soft target under the Department of Homeland Security because you can literally drive your car right up to the lobby with a bomb and blow the whole building up. Whereas a government facility, usually you have to go through a checkpoint or a gate or a scanning system to get access, like a military base would be considered a hard target. Well, since I'm a soft target, I had to go through a lot of training with FEMA and the Homeland Security Department on threat and risk assessment, um, things such as community emergency response, which is what you were talking about with the, the fire department, and prevention and response to suicide bombing. We had to be able to, like, kind of profile suicide bombers, be able to pick them out. Uh, and if there was a bomb that went off, we were trained on how to immediately respond to that bomb with all the agencies that would be showing up on our property. So that, that kind of sums up the training. Uh, how I got into this, um, I was basically 
in a bookstore one day, a national book chain, and someone walked up to me and handed me a book and said, this is for your book. And I looked at him like, uh, you want to repeat that to me? I'm a criminology major. I'm not a journalist. I'm not an English major. I'm not a writer. And basically the person said, no, this is for your book. And he said, I got to go. And he took off. You know, All right, I'm going to have to cut you off there because the break's coming up, Chris. But I'm going to make okay. you pick up there again because that, sure. that, it's very interesting that, you know, it sounds cloak and daggerish a little bit, but I, <laughs> I, I've heard this kind of stuff before. So, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. More with author Chris Tyson when we come back. We are back. Hanging out with author Chris Tyson. And by the way, I keep telling you guys he's an author, but I didn't mention the name of his book like an idiot. It's called America's New World Order. And I, I like how he named it. Instead of America, it's America, like the Amero. So uh, very clever uh, name play there in the title. Check it out. America, um, let me rephrase that. America's New World Order. Chris, is there a spot where they can order your book? The listeners, is there a website they can go to? Oh, yes. It's the same as the book title. It's America's New World Order dot com, and and if they go there, they can also see me on Twitter, Facebook, and I'm also on YouTube there too as well. All right, awesome. And uh, I'll have you mention that a few more times during the show, that, so that the listeners can go and hear it once or twice at least more and go check it out themselves. So let's get back into it. So you were handed some stuff, and you were told by some mysterious individual that this is for your book. And at the time you hadn't written a, you hadn't even contemplated writing a book yet, I guess. And you were like, huh? <laughs> exactly. And you know, it, it, it happened so fast too. It was like, he handed me the book and he said, my wife's in the car. I got to go. But for some reason, the, the Holy spirit and God told me to hand this book to you on the one aisle away from me. He said, go around the corner and you'll see a guy stand there and, and hand the book. So the guy handed me the book, and I was like, okay. So I kind of, I kind of blew that off. I, I, I looked at it and I thought about it because I'm a Christian. You know, I know about the Holy Spirit, but I was like, you know, I, I'm not going to write a book. It's not my thing. And uh, but something happened. I, I started researching. We had an online company, uh, me and some silent partners, and I started to research some things in our downtime about 9/11. And I realized that what they were telling us couldn't possibly be true because of my background. I knew it couldn't be true, um, and I saw a movie around that same time. It was online at the time. It's called Loose Change, and a lot of people know about this movie. But uh, man, that really opened my eyes. And I'll tell you what got my attention in that movie was with my background. It said the day that supposedly this plane hit the Pentagon that no none of the camera systems were working to show footage of the plane coming into the Pentagon, which there's no way that's possible. And I can tell you why from my background. Even in my hotels that I was the security director, we had a lot of times we had I had two camera systems sometimes in my building. I had a system and a backup system, or I had a, one system on a generator and one system not on a backup generator, and I had multiple cameras. I mean, we're talking just in a hotel, I had about sixty cameras. So there's no way that one of the most secure sites on the planet that all the cameras went down simultaneously as soon as that build, that plane hit that building, the Pentagon. There's no way. So that right there, to me, was a lie. It stood out as a lie. So after watching Loose Change, I started thinking, wait a second. If they're lying to us about this, what else are they lying about? And, I, you, you're, you know, obviously, as you know, as you go and you start doing all this research, and it starts to become unreal, you almost don't believe it. But one of the things that happened after that is I was over researching some of this stuff one night at one of my friends' house, and the light started flicking on and off, like spirit you know, spiritual, and the washing machine started clicking on and off. It was just unreal. I mean, the room got cold, like really chilly, like something was in the room on a spiritual level, almost like trying to hinder me from looking into this further, if you, if you, get, if you catch my drift. And this is what started for me, and I was ever, never able to let it go. And after those, those experiences, I just started, and by nature, in my job, I'm a someone who actually asks questions. I'm an investigative type in what I did for many years. I had to question people who were stealing, lying, cheating. That's what I did for a living. So I started looking into this as a researcher trying to find the truth. And the truth, it almost looks stranger than fiction, as you know. And that's kind of what got me into this. 
and, and got me to the point where I decided, I finally decided, you know what, I am going to write a book. I'm going to put this down in words so people can understand it. And you know, you've seen my book. I broke down a lot of information to a very simple level. Uh, well, I that's one of the things I like about your book. It's good for like to, for starters, for people that – I mean your book's a great read anyway. If somebody's already in this uh, – you'll because it's not super thick. You'll tear through it if you're already uh, knowledgeable about this. But for a starter book, for somebody that knows nothing about any of this, it is a great book because you condensed everything into – into this small, n- not small cover book, but you know what I mean. A sh- you know this thin book, I should say, where people won't they won't look at it and say, "Oh, it's a daunting task to read all this." You know, whereas if you get like um, uh, Mike Rupert's book, "Crossing the Rubicon," that thing looks like a telephone book. It's filled with awesome information, but you know, if you look at that, if you're not in the mindset that I have to go do this research. You're going to be like, oh, I don't want to read that whole book. So I, I really think you did a good job of taking the the crux of it, you know, like the, get, getting the gist of it and putting it in this book to introduce it to people and in hopes causing them to go research it themselves. I think it was you did a great job. Oh, I appreciate it, man. That that was the whole goal. The whole goal was, yeah, you know, I, I know, like you, I, I was grabbing books to understand this, like Ruled by Secrecy by Jim Mars. That's like four or five hundred pages, and I started to realize, hey, I don't want to read. I don't want the person that reads my book have to go through a thousand pages to understand the basics of what's going on. Like that was the goal, and that's that's what I was trying to do with the book. But uh, if you want, we can go into the book now at this point, or you have another way you want to go. No, go uh, go into the book a little bit. We you know we got a few minutes before we go we, before we come up to the, the next break. So go ahead and actually tell the listeners kind of how it breaks it down, and just give it a brief overview. At, you know. Okay. Um, the, the title. Let's just get into the title. That, that will take the time right there. Um, how I came about this title, and you picked up on it pretty quick, is I wanted to name the title based on the Amero, um, and I can get into that later why I came to that, but Amero being the North American Union, which is uh, United States, Mexico, and Canada, and a new world order. Everybody knows what the new world order is, and everybody knows that we were the new world when we were just supposedly discovered for the first time. I call it a rediscovery because you already had 40 million Native Americans living here. But anyway, the new world became the new world order. And so I called it America's New World Order, and then the subtitle of my book is called A Global Atlantis for the Age of Aquarius. Now, if anybody's into the occult, or they're into the new age, or they're into any type of uh, hidden behavior, we'd say secret society behavior, you know you know that next year we go on December 21st, 2012, we go into the new age. And the new age is the age of Aquarius. If you know your zodiac, we're actually going into the age of Aquarius. That's why I titled it that, because the new world is going to take effect inside of the new age, which starts next year. And the front side of that is a global Atlantis. Now, this is where a lot of people get thrown off. They're like, Atlantis? What does Atlantis have to do with this? Well, if you actually research the story of Atlantis, and we'll get get into this on the other side of the break, but if you actually understand the story of Atlantis, Atlantis is like the blueprint for the New World Order and always has been. Yeah, it's actually funny that, you, you know, you actually brought that. Well, I shouldn't say funny. I, I'm not funny, haha, but funny in a, ooh, you know, hmm, yeah. interesting. Um, synchroni- maybe synchronistic is a better term for it. Mm-hmm. I'm rereading Manly P. Hall's works right now. So it's funny that you, you, you bring that up because I actually just this morning read uh, – the chapter about where he's talking about Plato's writings on Atlantis. And for people that don't know, so the New World Order emulates Plato and everything. If you research, um, Plato's the only one that actually put to paper the stories of Atlantis. Before that, everything was just passed down. And it came from basically what Chris is talking about. Atlantis is this, this perfect government, this perfect society that – even if it didn't exist, Plato said, you know, he, he the way he put it was even if it didn't exist, it was a it was a story to show, you know, what happens with a political system, you know, how it can break down and everything. And that's basically what happened. And I urge you guys to really go check out Manly P. Hall. In fact, when I come back on the other side of the break, I'll go grab the book and uh, I'll read you guys the title of it. It's got two, both of his works in one uh, book, so you can just get it on Amazon. And 
that would actually be a great book as an addendum to Chris's book because what he's talking about is right on. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break. More with Chris Tyson when we come back. Stay tuned. You don't want to go anywhere. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. All right, get out your pen and your paper so I can give you your homework assignments for this evening. The Secret Destiny of America is the title of the book. And it's got all of Manly P. Hall's writings, two of his books. Uh, One of them is called The Secret Destiny of America, and the other one is America's Assignment with Destiny. It's got both of those works in one, so you can read everything with the original drawings and stuff that were in both of the books and um, and other pictures. And I, I suggest that you get, when you get Chris's book, that you get a Hall's book as a way to understand what he's talking about because Hall goes into it and he, he, he explains. And it's not like he came up with this, by the way. He was just a honorary 33rd degree mason because of his uh, work that he did do, uh, being like their little historian. So it's not like Hall or even Albert Pike came up with this stuff. Pike was a, 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 a Satanist, yes. Uh, Pike was an evil man, but it's not. this is something that's been going on. It, it predates him by thousands of years. So it's got nothing, you know, he's just, a. at the end of the day, Pike was just another, you know, long, long uh, he was another puppet in a long line of puppets, that's what I was trying to say. Anyway, it's a very synchronistic that, you know, Chris's book talks about that and that he actually came on today. And I didn't even put it together until we were, you know, talking in the last segment is when it hit me uh, that even in the, the second segment today, it's funny, I was actually going to read about um, some of the... Uh, the ancient the the title the section of the book is called the ancient league of nations which is what atlantis was pretty much and it, it gets into that so chris getting back into your book how do how were you able tell the listeners how you're able really quick just to tie it all together you know uh to, you know explain the atlantis uh end of it and how it it, it attaches to what we are today cuz the united states is their idea of this new atlantis um, well, actually, I can't take credit for that. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit uh, kind of guided me to certain parts of research. Because, you know, there's hundreds of books on New World Order. And the Holy Spirit kind of guided me to certain books and certain copies of books that kind of kind of tied it all together. Now, you know, getting into Atlantis, I know people kind of like, like you're saying, they kind of shriek their head when you talk about Atlantis. But let's, where did the story of Atlantis really come from? And everybody always says Plato. Well, Plato is just like Manly P. Hall and just like Albert Pike. He was the pen that put it on the paper. The actual story of Atlantis came from Solon. And Solon got the story from the Egyptian mystery schools, from the priest of the Egyptian mystery schools. And if you know anything about the Egyptian mystery school, which is a big part of Freemasonry, by the way, the doctrines, the Egyptian mystery school got their knowledge from the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. So the story of Atlantis, which was meant to be written down way before Plato, was actually the the model for world government way back to Babylon. And if you want, I'll kind of go into the similarities of Atlantis, ancient ancient Atlantis, to where we're heading right now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, in the story, well, he had two stories. He wrote two stories about Atlantis. People who know this researched Atlantis, but... Creitas, I can't say it right, C-R-I-T-I-A-S. That's one of the, the books he wrote about Atlantis, stories. Um, he, yeah, he, named wrote, it after, he named it after uh, one of his students who actually, like, he had conversations with this about. Oh, okay, I didn't even know that. Yeah. The, uh, the, let's look at, first of all, we all know about the bloodline, right? The Illuminati, royal bloodline, half hybrid, half satanic, and all that. We know all that. Anybody that's in the New World has figured that out at some point. The Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, the bloodline. Well, in the story of Atlantis, uh, Poseidon, who was a god, mated with Cleito, who was a mortal woman. And in that came a bloodline, a bloodline of his ten sons. His ten sons carried the blood of the gods and the blood of humans. So there's your hybrid bloodline right there, what we call the royal bloodline. Anyway, his ten sons, his first son, Atlas, you know the book called Atlas Shrug? Atlas? Atlas ruled the whole kingdom. The other nine sons were under his direction. 
but they all took their marching orders from Poseidon, the laws of Poseidon. Um, also, so here's your bloodline. Now, they had ten areas in Atlantis, ten areas that he ruled. Each king ruled an area. Everybody was poor, or at least in the same level of income, which we would call today a commonwealth or socialism. And what are we doing right now in America? We're wiping out the middle class. So there's going to be a king, and then there's going to be everybody else in the commonwealth. So anyway, you had a commonwealth, you had the ten rich kings, and in those commonwealths you basically had ten areas, which we have today. You have the ten world unions that are being formed around the world today. You have the African Union, you have the South American Union, you have the Mediterranean Union, you have the Pacific Union, you have the European Union, which everybody knows about, and then you're going to have the North American Union when America collapses. You'll have a merging of the labor and resources of Canada and the labor of Mexico to make America stand back up on its feet It'll be a new union. And that's why I titled the book Amero instead of Americas. Anyway, in that process, you also had an economy that was ruled, like I told you, by Commonwealth. And then they traded among themselves. The ten areas traded among themselves, which means they had to have a common currency to do that, a means of exchange. And what did we have during the crisis of 2008 2009? How many world leaders came out and said we need an international currency? We need a new currency, a new financial order. And what they're talking about is, it, and if you look into this right now, that they're hoping that will be the special drawing rights, which is done by the IMF. And if you've looked in the last month, they put over $800 billion into the funding for special drawing rights, which used to be a very small account, $40 billion or so. So what I'm trying to tell you is we're going away from the dollar to an international currency. Right now, the dollar tonight, if, you don't, if your listeners don't know, a lot of them will know, is the currency of the world. That is what feeds the world. We print money, and it spreads out across the planet. That role is about to be taken away from America, and when it does, we will collapse. And we're going to move to an international currency. So if you look up special drawing rights, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, that's the economy of it. The politics of it is you had the ten kings who ruled the region, the ten global unions. Now, these ten global unions will answer to the United Nations, or at least be under their authority. Then you have the ten unions, and in the religious aspect, they all uh, were self-enlightened people. So if you know anything about enlightenment, which is where you become your own god, you open up your seven chakras and you become your own god. So you have these enlightened beings, but they also all worshipped a golden statue of Poseidon that was in the temple of Poseidon. And you say, well, why does that matter? Well, it does matter because it says in the latter days in the Bible that everybody will worship the image of the beast. So it's their, their, this is their playbook. I'm telling you, this is their blueprint. And you go look at the legal side of this. It says they followed the laws of Poseidon inscribed on the pillar of or, Orcha, Orcha Loam. I can't say that either. Orcha Loam. If there was a pillar. Now, if you know the Masons have two pillars when you walk into a temple, you have Joaz and Bochum. Uh, and those are the two uh, pillars with knowledge written on them. This is the same similarity. You have a knowledge written on a, written on a, on a pillar of the law that would rule. Now, we're not talking about, we're talking about secular law. They're not religious law, secular law. And I'll explain that later when we get into America. But the military also was ruled together. All the kings would come together and vote on who they're going to attack. Now, you just saw Libya, how all these countries got together in the United Nations Security Council, right, and NATO, to decide who's going to bomb Libya. Well, we decided the French would go in first. You remember this? This happened about five, six months ago. Yep. And then, then America would come in and clean up, which is what we did. So what I'm trying to tell you is the model, even for the military, was in Atlantis is what they're using today. If you look at the Nine Nations Security Council, you've got so many people on that, at the table that get to vote on who they're going to attack jointly. So that's the same model that was used in Atlantis. So basically, I'm talking about military, legal, religion, politics, and economy. Pretty much sums it up. That's a society I'm describing, a civilization. And that's the new model of where they're trying to head to with the New World Order. Because if you know, if you research the New World Order, there's a lot of moving parts to the New World Order. It's very deceptive. It's hidden in businesses. It's hidden in secret councils. It's hidden in political groups, such as the Council on Foreign Relations or the Trilateral Commission. So what I'm trying to tell you is all these moving parts are eventually going to equal what I'm telling you right now. They're going to equal this model I just described to you. Now, what's interesting about Atlantis is there's someone who's wrote a book on Atlantis coming out, rising again, in the age of Aquarius, which is very interesting. 
And matter of fact, one of the authors, Frank Joseph, he wrote that uh, the, the Mayan calendar is uh, is the story of Atlantis. It's the revival of Atlantis, a new model, a new system, a new world order. So that that's kind of how I got into the ancient Atlantis portion of the book. And it's very interesting because where they got the information from. It is interesting. And I urge the people, again, when you go buy Chris's book, and you should buy his book, make sure you get The Secret Destiny of America by Manly P. Hall because it'll help you understand his book. And it, Amazing. Great job, Chris. We're going to break, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Hanging out with author Chris Tyson. And I have some good news for you. He will be hanging out in hour number two with us through to the end. Uh, Chris, would, or Chris was originally scheduled uh, for an hour, but because, uh, you know, one hour is never enough. And uh, we're having such a, a good conversation here about, you know, what the ultimate plan is and what these people, these elitists, whatever you want to call them, I call them the Illuma douchebags, but whatever they, their grand plan, you know, we're laying it out kind of in a nutshell. So, uh, Chris has been gracious enough to hang out for an extra hour with us. So I want to say thank you to Chris again. And go ahead and give out uh, the website again for the book so people can go check it out. Oh, and thanks for letting me hang around. Uh, my, the website is uh, www.americasnewworldorder.com. Uh, and they can go there. And I, I'm on, again, like I said, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. They can follow what I'm tracking you know, on a weekly basis. Awesome. Let's get, let's get right back into it. Now that we've talked about the old Atlantis and uh, we've given a brief description of you know what their plan is and, and you know how how long this goes back um, let's get into the new Atlantis the United States of America oh great this is and this is the connection uh, remember now ancient Atlantis was a model that the Greeks could never get together they tried with Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and he tutored Alexander the Great and if you remember Alexander the Great, when he conquered all that land, he tried to keep people to keep their own religion and, you know, his own, their own customs as long as they were part of the Greek Empire. Well, it didn't work, you know, and it, it failed. And Rome failed, too, even with the Senate. But when we get to America, it's different because we actually combine the elements of the Socratic method from Plato and Aristotle with our House, our house of Representatives. And that's what they do when they argue in the House. It's the Socratic method. We actually had the Senate from Rome, right? We have our senators, and we have the elements even of Egypt in our, in our systems. So what I'm trying to tell you is all these failed systems equal to a system they called a great success, and that was the new world, the new world order. And inside the new Atlantis, and I want to read something out of a, this is a quote from my, in my book from Jim Garrison. He was the founder and president of the Gorbachev Foundation. He was the chairman and president of the State of the World Forum. And it says, what was the original visionary imprint of what became the United States of America? It came actually from Francis Bacon, who was one of the greatest mystics, there's the occult influence right there, mystic, of the late 16th and early 17th centuries. He wrote a book right before he died called New Atlantis. It's also worth mentioning that the founding fathers of the United States, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, etc., were all Masons and all Rosicrucifixions. They were all students of Bacon, and they believed what they were creating was the new Atlantis. Now, what is the new Atlantis? The new Atlantis is on the back of your dollar bill. It's the all-seeing eye. It's the pyramid, and it's called Novus Ordo Secordum, in Latin, in Rome, meaning a new order of the ages. Now, what age are they talking about? They're talking about building this through the ages, meaning it started with Babylon, it went to Egypt, it went to Persia, it went to Greece, it went to Rome, then it went to the British Empire, and now it's on our soil. That's why we currently hold the flame, the enlightened flame, the Illuminati flame, on our statue of Isis, statue of Queen Samarius, statue, statue of Marianne, statue of Britannica. We call her Columbia, Lady Liberty. We're currently holding the flame. We're moving this New World Order into reality. We are currently the ones pushing for it. All these other kingdoms... That's who Britain, by the way, is named for. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if we look at Novus Ordo Secorum, now what kind of order are they talking about? Well, we know in 1776, and with the Constitution, they separated church from the state. Now, if you know anything about the, the old world, which was the old Rome, 
the old Britain, they were ruled by the Pope or the Church of England. They had a huge influence on the kings and queens in the Middle Ages. When you came to the New World, we no longer had that. Now, the Puritans tried to enforce that with the orders of 1639, which I put in the back of my books. You can actually read it. They were actually trying to still continue that rule, the rule of the church over politics. But the Masons weren't going to have it because the Masons believed in religious freedom for all. And that's why when you walk into a Masonic temple, you have the Quran, you have the Bible, you have the Freemason Bible, you, you get the drift. In other words, they allow all religion. Well, you say, well, that's a good thing. It is, but it isn't. Because inside of a secular order, which is what we are, we are a new secular order of the ages. And if you look at the word secular, it means earthly. It means pagan, pagan order. And now you understand, like we were just talking about this in the break, people like Benjamin Franklin are not who they appear to be. He was actually a pagan. He actually was part of the Hellfires Club in England, where they did uh, they had sexual orgies. They got drunk, and they did all kinds of sacrifices. And there was bones found all around his house after he died, underneath his house. So what I'm trying to tell you is this is a new pagan order for the final age. Now, the final age is not America. The final age is the next step, which will be a, the age of Aquarius. We're not going to be America. We're going to be part of the ten unions inside of this new age of Aquarius. We'll no longer be the big dog. We'll no longer t t dictate world policy. It'll be run through a, a collective decision, a dem democratic collective decision of all the ten unions. An interesting factoid, that's what the Olympic rings represent, is this, you know, all these different unions coming together, creating one world. You know, that's, that's what they always push, too. And you know who created the Olympic ring design, don't you? Uh, I don't know that. Adolf Hitler. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I do. That's right. That's right. He had, that's right. He had the rings. And he but it's not all world connected, world. Chris. Come on. That's you're, right. you're a conspiracy theorist for putting all this together, even though it's laid out right in front of you. Exactly. If you just do the research about what I'm talking about, you'll see you'll come back to these same conclusions. But let me tell you something interesting about the new Atlantis, what they called the American experiment. The American experiment was, could 13 colonies come together? Could 50 states come together? Eventually, could Canada, Mexico, and the United States come together under one federal republic? And if that was possible, and that that could be a success, which it has been, clearly, we're the most prosperous country in the history of the world, it has been a success, they knew they could emulate that all around the globe. And that's why Europe started to do what we did. They started to put all these – look at France as a state. Look at Germany as a state. Just like in the United States, you have Florida or Georgia. They applied that same model to Europe, and then they applied it to Africa, and then they applied it to the South American Union. In other words, they used us as the testing grounds for their new system, their new unions. But it's interesting enough, 13, by the way – remember now, we started with 13 colonies. 13 is a very big number in the occult. And what it means, with the, if you look at the tarot side, the tarot card, it's the death card, it's the phoenix, it's the serpent. And it also means precursor to conclusion. Did you catch that? We're the last empire before the final empire rises up. We are a precursor to conclusion. That's what 13 means in the occult. Also, you know, you get the 13th Zodiac that just came out last year. They made public, which Nostradamus knew about. Oh, oh, was it Ophiuchus? The 13th Zodiac? Yeah, Ophi, Ophiuchus or whatever. That Ophi, yeah, you're, right. Sorry, Ophiuchus, you're right. And it's the serpent bear. Serpent. Serpent bear. And let me tell you something else. If you know anything about the numbers, numerology, and the occult, seven is the number of God. Six is the number of man. If you put them together, what do you got? A God-man, right? A God-woman, a God-man, an enlightened man, an enlightened woman. And that comes to the number 13. So you have this. This was all predestined. They didn't want 14 colonies. They wanted 13 colonies because it had a very significant number to the occult. Yep, and uh, Mark Passio and I, who uh, he's over on Oracle. In fact, he's live right now over there. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. We actually did like a two-and-a-half-hour show about the occult, and we talked about the numerology end of it and stuff. So, of course, these people that are trying to create this new Atlantis are going to set things up with that. Uh, the occult numerology and symbolism and everything in it, which was incorporated into Freemasonry. And not all Freemasons are bad either. <clears throat> Remember what uh, Washington wrote in his um, uh, diary. 
that he he knew that the the Illuminati were in New York and he did not you know they were trying to infiltrate the Freemasons and he didn't think that all Freemasons were bad but he knew that there were he knew that Freemasonry had been infiltrated and had been used by these secret societies so he knew yeah and and you look at the penny right on the back of the penny you got e pluribus unum and latin means out of many one and they weren't talking about just 13 colonies out of many one they were actually talking not about 50 states either by the way they were saying their ultimate goal for the world is out of many unions will come one. You say, well, how do you know it's a union? Read the Declaration of Independence. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, union has always been the goal, a commonwealth, ten unions for the globe, come together, out of many equals one. So that is the goal of the new Atlantis. And, and they pushed why, that after 9-11, by the way. They, they, that was That was one of the mottos they pushed, remember? Absolutely. Out of many, we can become one strong nation. E pluribus right. unum. Exactly. And then you look at all the founding fathers. I mean, I know when I start talking about founding fathers, I upset people. But if you actually look at them, Washington, if you look going to the U.S. Capitol building, you look at the ceiling, you have an enlightened God, man, Washington. He's becoming godlike on a throne in the stance of Zeus. And around him is the 13 maidens. 13, there's that number again. And then you have 72 upside-down pentagrams, which is the symbol of Satanism. 72 representing the demonic spirits of the Shemaprosh. The it's Lester. there. I'm going to have to cut you off, Chris, because we're going to get okay. cut off by the break here. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for hour number two. As always, my show, the information that I, I uh, bring forward never allows just for one hour. So... Stay tuned. I promise we'll, we will be back with our number two in just a few minutes. Hanging out with author Chris Tyson. Check his book out, America's New World Order. We'll be right back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with our number two of this live Sunday edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. Don't forget to check my website out. A plethora of information, videos, and more. Uh updated with at least one or two articles daily, usually more. Today, I'm talking with author and researcher Chris Tyson. Chris, tell the listeners uh, real quick where they can get your book again, the title. And um, I got a few emails, actually, from a few people I know uh, in the alternative uh, media community. They'd like to know where they can get in touch with you um, to do interviews and have you on their shows. So if you could give that out, that would uh, be helpful because I know a few of them are listening right now. So go ahead and give sure. all that info uh, out. Sure. Uh, again, the website is www, and I'll just spell it, A-M-E-R-O-C-A-S, New World Order. America's New World Order, just like the title of my book. Uh, the title is America's New World Order, a global Atlantis for the age of Aquarius. And they can contact me right through my website. There's a contact tab there they can go to and email me directly. Uh, they just click on the link and email me right there. And they can also follow me, like I told you, on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. If they want to keep up what I'm watching, just like what you're doing, updating all the time. Awesome. All right, let's get right back into it because I know the listeners are, you know, they're eager to get back into the information. And actually, you know what? Before we get back into it, I'm going to stifle myself for a second. There's, I, I did forget. There was one more thing I want to bring up. Um, I know some people, for some reason, have an issue with certain types of information like this. When you start to weave uh, everything together, religion, politics, um, you know, ancient texts, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes the occult, which is nothing more, occult means hidden. So it's nothing, occult knowledge means hidden knowledge, okay? Some people get all jammed up and they... Uh, you know, they, oh, well, you know, I'm not, you know, you start talking about religion and you lose me. You have to understand that all of this stuff is connected. And they they teach you sometimes, if you look at it, it's not even sometimes. Most of the time, when you see this, peop when, when you see people attacking religion, it's a lot of, uh, you know, more than 50% of the time, people are put up to that. Why? Why is it put in movies? Why is it put in TV? And I'm not attacking or excuse me, I'm not defending mainstream religion. <clears throat> any of them. I don't like any organized religion. I think people need to, you know, research that stuff for themselves. I don't think that you need some some other intermediary between you and whatever creative force there is out there. That I think is crap. That's a way to control people. But this this hatred of even talking about religion 
like that it's a uh, oh it's a faux pas you can't talk about that you know oh, you you brought up religion oh you know it that's done so that when you start to look into this okay and because there's an an inevitable connection there and when you start to look into this you see this it, that's done so it elicits that same Pavlovian response of laughing, giggling, and pointing fingers. Because again, many people we were we were all conditioned through this. Most of us, unless you're much older, and even then it was still somewhat of the same conditioning. We're taught to laugh at what seems different or foreign to us. So to look at this information with that kind of, you know what I mean? If you look at it just, you know, and you start to point fingers and laugh at something, check yourself. Realize that you're, it's a conditioned response. Look, I had to do that when I first got into it. And I know that a lot of times when, when, when religion gets brought up into the, the, the talk and the realm of the conversation that you're in, people get all uppity about it, whether they're in defense of it or they're crapping all over it. Yet you have to put all that bias aside and just look at the information you know, with no emotion, just look at it for what it is, and then maybe you'll change that emotional response because now you have a new influx of data. I just wanted to get that out there before we went any further because, again – we're talking about some uh, esoteric things, and people might, you know, oh, you know, uh, some of this is kind of weird, and it might mess with my my religious beliefs. Just put all that stuff aside. Take any dogma, religious dogma, whatever, put it aside, and just look at it as information. And then maybe, who knows? Maybe maybe that'll uh, uh, unlock a door and, and open something in your mind, and it'll be like you'll put two and two together. That's just my thoughts. So, um, Chris, let's get back into it. The new age of Atlantis here. What do you see, you know, with everything that's going on now, the NDAA and all this? Do you think they're panicking? From my view, they're panicking. A, a lot of this, you know, they're way behind schedule, and I think that they're really freaking out, and they're working with some sort of time frame for for one reason or another. What say you? Yeah, I think they're they're well. They they did a massive power grab uh, with the Patriot Act. If you go back and look at that. NDA is serious. It's a serious law. It just got passed. I agree. But if you go back and look uh, at what the Patriot Act did, it's to this day, I can't believe we're still allowing this to exist, this department, the Homeland Security Department. Because, yes, th- to answer your question, they're trying to circle the wagons and get their system in place, just like Hitler had, in order to shut it all down. And, you know, the reason I say the Patriot Act is because they pretty much put together 20 agencies or more under one department that has massive power. And if you don't think so, go to the airport and disagree with the TSA, TSA agent and see how long that lasts and see what room you wind up in and how much trouble you're in. You know, that's how much power these people have now inside of this department. You know, so, and, you know, we know, the people in the truth would know, that this whole war on terror is a farce, that it was all created to create an enemy that we can never beat, we can never win, we can never get them to stop bombing us. So this, the whole idea of the Patriot Act is providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Well, how do we know we win against terrorism? We never will. So the Patriot, the Homeland Security Department is only going to get larger and larger and more powerful and more powerful. I mean, so that's where we're heading in all this. I think, yes, they're, they're trying to finish the final touches on the laws to where they can do what they need to do with the public. And I think really what they're most worried about is the people that are going to rise up. I don't think they're worried about the average Joe, you know, watching, you know, Dancing with the Stars or American Idol. He, they're not worried about that guy because that guy's not tuned in to what's really going on. I'm talking about the people who are awake and aware. They are concerned, and they know the Internet. They need to shut the Internet down, too. They know that, and they need to do it quick. Because information is flowing between, like, your shows and other radio shows that are exposing the, the stuff that's in the dark, what you call the occult, the hidden knowledge. This, this stuff is being brought out now with the instruments such as the Internet and, and these new tools we have to research all this information. It's one of the most important things in this whole fight is the information itself. Yep. And it, it, that's why I don't like digital... Uh, <clears throat> that's why I don't like uh, 
like digital archives, ebook. I do for passing them out and get, you know, I, I know I have an ebook section on federaljack.com, but I'm talking about like for your own personal stuff. I always th- tell people get a physical copy because if we, it, even if it wasn't terrorist, and I'm doing air quotes, so obviously, you know, uh, you know, New World Order um, related uh, EMP burst, maybe some country does it, or you never know, solar flare could come. Our electrical grid is ridiculously old and out of date. So it, you know, I mean, look at the blackout that happened up in New York. It, it, we're at risk. It, it's very, it, it's in your face now. So I think that the chance of losing this information is great. So it's better to have a physical copy, a book. And that's why one of the reasons that they're, they're, I think they're getting rid of all the, the books in schools, as well as what Charlotte Isserby talked about in her book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. If you don't have it, uh, try to get um, – she has a PDF copy. kind of sucks because the original is out of print. You can get copies for a couple hundred bucks here or there. But she just uh, did a uh, – I think it's a, an abridged version, and uh, you, you can look up – she tells you where you can go look up online for stuff that sh- she cut out, but it's still pretty uh, pretty big. And um, you can you can get like a reprint of her book, I think right now. You have to go to go to her uh, deliberatedumbingdown.com. I think it'll tell you how to get it. But uh, in her book, she talked about them getting rid of school books and everything else, and using uh, computers uh, and lap uh, you know maybe laptops. At the time, nobody thought that was possible, and even when laptops came out, everybody was like, they're still too big. Well, now they have iPads, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. And they can change the information. They can, you know, they can change history right there. Boom. It's whatever gets beamed into that iPad is what that kid learns. So we are in 1984, ladies and gentlemen. Don't worry about it coming. We're here. Time to stand up and do something about it. We're going to break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned for more. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. We got cut off by the break. Always when you get into a deep conversation, you lose track of time. It's amazing. I mean, look, we're already almost halfway through the show. Time just goes like that. I'm, that's how fast it goes by on my show, always. So I'm hanging out today with Chris Tyson. And we're going over the whole, the first hour we covered Atlantis real well and the old stories of it and the old Atlantis and the connection to the new. Now I want to get Chris's thoughts on a few things. And again, uh, before we get into it, Chris, give out your website again for your book because I think it's a really good book. If you know anybody, guys, this is to the listeners, that you want to wake up, Chris's book is really good for that because, again, it's a ton of this information condensed into a, a much thinner book and then he goes and he tells you, you know, where you can go research it further. His whole goal is, like mine is, to get people to go out and do their own research. That's his goal too. So I, I support him because he doesn't run around trying to make money off of his book. And obviously you have to – it costs money to make it. So he has to make that back. But he's not, he's not in this for money. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't run around trying to make a bazillion dollars or anything. So, you know – I suggest getting his book. I have a copy of it myself. It's in my personal library. And I suggest going out and getting his book. It's not that expensive. And again, if you know someone that you want to wake up, get it and give it to them. Get like two copies and give the give it give one to them and maybe somebody else that you know, you know, and tell them, you know, if use that as like your little research manual and then they can go look other things up. So Give out the information where they can get your book one more time because I think it's really important to always have a physical copy of the stuff. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the uh, the website is www.amerocasnewworldorder.com. America's New World Order dot com. And uh, if you'd like, real quick, before you get into the to this part of the segment, I'd like to uh, speak on the unions real quick because we didn't touch on this, and I want to kind of show you where this is all being happening right in front of us right now. Yeah, no, well, that's well, then that, that's okay. what I was probably I, I wanted to get into. I, I was going to get along the lines of the questioning of what you feel now with that, uh, you know, what's going on with the police state and everything. So that that that'll work out perfectly. Uh, go ahead and tell them about the unions and then how it's merging into what you see today right in front of you. Okay, uh, three weeks ago, you had France and Germany make a huge statement. Basically, with Europe collapsing and the euro, 
they decided that they need to merge their central banks. There's a lot of talk of them merging their central banks into one bank that would be basically the distributor, like our Federal Reserve Bank, for the European Union. And they feel like France and Germany pulling their weight together could finance that and back it. So that's huge. So in other words, not only has France lost their country identity in Germany, they're about to lose their economic identity, I mean their own central bank. So they're merging those as well. But here's the thing. I, this is in the, uh, I picked up the copy of Foreign Affairs, which is the publication of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, this month. And there's actually a very good article in here about it says how we got to where we are. It's called How We Got Here. And I want to read something that kind of backs up what I'm talking about. First of all, when I talk about these unions, the European Union was not ever founded to be a political union. Now, that might have been the goal. But the original purpose of the European Union was an economic coming together, a trade area, a trade zone, a free trade zone, like NAFTA. And if you look around the world, before like all these unions started to come together in the 90s, all of them had trade unions. You had uh, GAFTA for the Mediterranean, GAFTA, which is the Greater Arabic Free Trade Union. You had NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. You had SAFTA in South America. You had CAFTA down in the Caribbean. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, and you have AFTA, there, there's just, if you look at this in the 90s, they, it wasn't just NAFTA now. They were working on us with NAFTA, but they were actually doing these free trade agreements all around the world. And you say, well, why does that matter? I'm about to show you why it matters. Because it says right here in this article, and this is the elite talking now. This is their place where they write out their article. This is America thinking was that economic openness was an essential element of a stable and peaceful world political order. Prosperous neighbors are the best neighbors, remarked Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt's the one that put the Illuminati symbol on the dollar bill with Nicholas Rourke, the occultist, and Henry Wallace, his occult 33rd degree Mason vice president. Now, you say, so what I'm trying to explain to you is, is that the free trade agreements are always how they start a political union. They do the trading zones first, then they merge the political bodies. And that's why the European Economic Community eventually became the European Union. And if you look at all the trade agreements in Africa, in South America, and over in Australia, the Pacific Union, you look, you'll see a trade agreement there before they became a political body, nine times out of ten. So what I'm trying to tell you, even though the American people are aware of NAFTA and they're awake to the superhighway and the trade embargoes and the relationships of the Security and Prosperity Partnership, SPP.gov, they don't realize it, but they've already took a bold step to basically say, we're going to merge this also into a political union. So once again, this is backing the concept of ancient Atlantis with the ten kings. So you're going to have ten kings, basically, and then you're going to have an ultimate world leader. And, it, you know, I don't want to step across that line as far as biblical stuff, but it says also on that last day there will be a, a world leader, you know. And uh, so what I'm trying to tell you is it starts with trade agreements. Free trade is a bad word. If you understand free trade, it took a lot of our jobs away from Americans, too, in the, in the, in the Rust Belt, in the heartland of America, and a lot of the manufacturing towns. A lot of people can attest to this across the country. They lost their jobs because of free trade. And what it is, is it's basically trying to equal the trading agreements across the planet where everybody comes up to a certain level of wealth, a certain level of economy for everybody, not just America. So America has to go down in order to equal the lifestyle in Africa that needs to come up. See, because remember, I told you this is a social commonwealth, meaning everybody's on an equal footing. We're all in this together. So I just want to bring that up and point it out. And, it, and then they actually talk about all this further in the article. You know, that basically once the, the, the country has a stable economy and a middle class or a, a building of a middle class, they can then entertain the idea of democracy, which is the world political system, which is the world order. Our political system is the model for the new world order. And our founding fathers knew it 200-something years ago. So our foreign policy, if you look at the money spent on our foreign policy and how many bases we have around the world, you'll figure out very quickly we're enforcing our will on the rest of the planet. It's not just the Middle East. We have bases all over this globe. 
So we are basically pushing democracy on everybody that will be open to it and will trade with us and will take the idea of democracy. Now, democracy in itself is not a bad thing, but this is the model for the final system. Now, remember, I told you, precursor to conclusion. So we are setting the stage of a world order, a liberal democracy, a secular order, and a liberal democracy for the entire planet. And the model was the United States, which is now being applied all over the world. And as you remember, George Bush, the, the son, Skull and Bones, which is modern-day Templars, when he got up and gave his speech, Council on Foreign Relations member, he said, we're going to spread the flame of liberty around the four corners of the earth, and those who resist that flame will be burned by it. That's what he was talking about. So I, I just wanted to make that analogy and, and kind of explain that out to your listeners. Oh, that was perfect, uh, and I'm glad you actually, you actually had enough time going right into the break where you can explain it. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. We are deep down the rabbit hole today. We are, we're not at the bottom, but we are very close. This is important information. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Three minutes. Don't go anywhere. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what Chris and I are discussing today is not, how can I put this? It is the... It is not some uh, wild theory. It is actually in their own writings. It is not some bedtime story. It, it, it is not some, um, some fable that you tell your children that has been passed down through the ages. Although it is what they do call, this is what they call the work of ages. Uh, this is not some fable. This is not, again, some, some fictional story. It's scary, and if you look at everything that's going on today, everything around the world, the attack on Libya, the ramping up of the, the drumbeat of war with Iran, everything, this is about getting everybody in line, you know, order out of chaos, one world order. And although living in a world community where we can explore space and the ocean and everything else together and not have war sounds awesome, that's not what they have in mind. So we need to, we're evolving without a doubt as a species, as individuals, spiritually, we're evolving. And they understand that, at, you know, at least from my take on this, they understand that once we get to a certain level in this evolution, there is no way that they're going to be able to control us the way they do because we're going to see through it. And that's what happens. You know, wars would end tomorrow if soldiers refused to fight. If there was nobody to join the military and fight, there wouldn't be any wars. It'd be pretty hard to stage a war if everybody stayed home, right? So that's why you need to understand their complete work, their plan, what's going on. This is the basis, the foundation of why 9-11 happened, why Oklahoma City, why everything, because it's all – to forward this much larger agenda. And certain things get in their way and they deal with those speed bumps accordingly. Sometimes it's a, uh, uh, a war. Sometimes it's a terror attack to set off a war. Sometimes it's an assassination of the person that stands in their way. Whatever it may be, they deal with it as it comes. But it's all because of this larger plan behind the scenes. That's why anytime I talk about the JFK assassination, 9-11, anything, I always tell people you have to understand your enemy, the people who is the people that pulled this off. That's who the enemy, I'm doing air quotes, that's who they are. And you have to understand them. Otherwise, you have no way, you stand no chance of ever being able to stop what they want to do because you don't understand what their plan is. You know, If you think it's one thing and it's actually something else, you're not really being effective at stopping it. What say you, Chris? No, I agree. And it's funny you talk about Iran. In the same uh, publication of Foreign Affairs this month is a whole article by Matthew Croning saying, Kronig saying it's time to attack Iran, how to do a surgical strike and not disrupt the whole world. So, you know, it's right here in their own publication. It's Council on Foreign Relations, the Foreign Affairs uh, magazine for this month says time to, time to attack Iran. 
Now, I don't think it'll happen in the next few weeks, but I think it could happen by the end of the year. And uh, you're right. It's all to further their agenda. It's all to further their goals. You know, the, the, the whole point of 9-11 was to bring, around, bring, a part, bring, a, bring out in the open a security apparatus like the Department of Homeland Security, just like Germany, just like Hitler had his whole, his whole group of soldiers. So, yes, there, it's all, it's all got a program. It's all methodical. It's all planned out on certain dates they do this stuff. If you know the occult, 9-11, 11 being a prime number. But 13 also, number 13. But, you know, I'd like also to tell you kind of where this is all going with the age of Aquarius, if we could go there a little bit. Yeah, let's get into it. Okay. Uh, the reason I titled the book A Global Atlantis for the Age of Aquarius is because the great work of the ages is about to come to fruition. It's about to become out, put out in the open. Everything that's been hidden in the dark is about to become put in the open in the next few years. And I believe the kickstart party to all this is the... The prelude, if you recall it, starts on December 21st, 2012. The Mayans, by the way, who were shamans, which is witch doctors, they channel, they knew about the new dawn. They call it the new dawn. They also call it the shift of the ages. Now, what did they mean, shift of the ages? They meant we were shifting from the age of Pisces, which was ruled by religious dogma, ruled by Jesus and his disciples, to Aquarian age. Now, you say, well, how do you know age of Pisces was ruled by the church? Well, if you look at the age of Pisces, you know, Jesus was a, he was a, he was the symbol of the fish. His disciples were the fishers of men. He called them the fishers of men. And if you, and Pisces is ruled, the era of Pisces is ruled in part by religious dogma. And that's why you had the church, the Catholic church had such power for hundreds and hundreds of years in Europe. But now we're moving into a secular age, a pagan age, an age of Aquarius what the ancients called a new golden dawn. And we're moving into that era starting next year, at the end of this year, going into next year. Now, what are the characteristics of the age of Aquarius? Well, if you look back in the 1969, you had a prelude, a kind of a, 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 a glimmer of look into what is coming with the, the flower children, the flower power of the 1960s. There was a group in 1969 called, they had a song called Aquarius, Let the Sun Shine In by the Fifth Dimension. Now, we're talking fifth dimension here, talking spiritual. And the first, one of the choruses of that song, it says, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Now, the idea of Aquarius is a global brotherhood. That's a characteristic. Now, where else have you seen the word global brotherhood? The Freemasons, right? And it says there'll be revolutions. What you're seeing in revolutions right now all over the world. It says it's also a time of democracy. Remember, I just told you they're trying to spread democracy all over the four corners of the planet. It's also a time of human rights. You know, you're seeing all these people with the, with the, with the gay rights, the homosexual rights, all that's coming to the surface. Everybody wants their individual rights. That's a, that's a characteristic of the Aquarian age. You're also going to see massive humanitarian movements, which is like to, to attack the AIDS virus and all these different programs to feed people who are starving through the United Nations. You're also going to see a blast of innovative technology. I mean, what we're dealing with right now with Skype and the Internet and being able to research anything, it's going to get even better because that's the tool they're going to use to bring us all together. Because I can't relate to somebody in China tonight. I can't speak their language, but the technology will be able to bridge that gap in the Aquarian age. You're also going to see a lot of sudden changes and upheavals with weather patterns. It's all part of the Aquarian age. You're going to see a lot of people have mental breakdowns because they can't handle the change. They can't handle what you call evolutionary change. They're not going to be able to handle it. And then there's also going to be a massive concern for the environment in the Aquarian age. And what do you see almost in every uh, place you work today? You go in and they talk about, you know, we got to make a profit, but we also got to save the environment. We got to save the manatees. We got to save the monkeys. We got to save the water supply. We got to save the national parks. So what you're saying, that's the whole green movement, and it's, it's to save the earth. And if you look up the, what paganism really is at the core of it, it's, it's called the sacred earth. They want to save the sacred earth and not tread on it. Now, I'm not for destroying the planet and the environment. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's the heart of paganism is to save the earth, to save the planet. And that's what's going to bring everybody together, I believe. It won't be Catholicism, Protestant, you know, any Protestant faith or an Islamic faith, or, you know, it's not going to be a faith that brings us together. It's going to be the planet that brings everybody collectively together. And that's their plan. And that's why you see the green movement. Every, every business now is going green. 
everything on the planet. Cars are going green. Even bad computers, you don't want to throw them away. It'll hurt the environment. You've got to you dispose of these things properly. What I'm trying to tell you is every part of your life is going green. Even in the grocery store, you need to pick up a recyclable bag now. Don't take the old bag that you've got to throw away and hurt the environment. You're killing trees. So this has been indoctrinated all around us, and this isn't just happening in America. If you go to other countries, they're also heavily into the recycle green movement. But anyway, that's how we're going to all come together, I believe, under the concern for the environment. And there's one more part to this, and I don't know if we have time to get into it. Like a lot. Gaia, the Gaia spirit, the Earth spirit, exactly, all that. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Mother Earth. And that's Good why when you, go to, when you go to Denver International Airport, which I did, and you take pictures, you'll see that the New Age, there's a big mural, the New Age. And all the cultures of the world are gathered around this plant that's coming up out of the ground, right in the Denver Airport. And what is that representing? It's representing the new dawn, the new Earth, the new world order for the new dawn the new earth and mother earth you're right the gaia the, that's what the native americans they knew exactly about this they knew all about it so they're all the ancient cultures so when we come back i'd like to uh, to go into what the main goal of this age is though yeah we have one segment left so that's what we'll do we'll spend the last segment talking about their their end goal their end game ladies and gentlemen you need to understand the basic game so you can understand how it's being played otherwise we stand no chance in changing it and winning we'll be right back stay tuned all right ladies and gentlemen we're back for the final segment of today's edition of down the rabbit hall i'm hanging out with chris tyson chris let's wrap it up for them um what is pretty much the end game of this what are they uh what would they the elitists these illuminati whatever you want to call them what is their end game what do they want to do with this this new age this new order of the ages um to to put it bluntly they don't just want your house and your air and your water they want not just your body they ultimately want your soul now i know that sounds cliche but i'm i'm dead on and i'm being very serious about this they want your soul uh this is a luciferian agenda and you know if you dig down deep enough you'll find satanic elements in almost all parts of this and the whole idea of the new age and it's working perfectly for the aquarian age is a deception that's coming and the deception is self-worship and self-enlightenment and once you open yourself up to self-enlightenment and self-worship and i'm talking about the kundalini serpent if you look into the kundalini serpent you'll know what i'm talking about uh, it's just like when you're on LSD with Timothy Leary back in the 60s, you open up your chakras. If you open up all your chakras, you open yourself up to earthly spirits, which you call the Gaia, which a lot of those spirits are demonic. Um, they're not all good beings. And these spirits can come inside of you and possess you. Um, I know it sounds way out there, but this is where it's going. The goal is not just to take your house away, take your car away, and make you have take their food stamps and go to their, whatever you want to call their concentration camps or rehabilitation centers. The goal is ultimately that you perish and that your soul perishes. And it's a, it's a Luciferian agenda. It's been a Luciferian agenda from the beginning. Now, a question will say, well, I'm not worshiping myself. Really? Well, let's think about this for a minute. You got an iPhone. You got an iPod. You got MySpace. You got YouTube. It's all about you. It's all about me. You see what I'm saying? And this is that when you start worshiping inward, you don't see what's going on outward. And this godlike stick that I'm talking about, they call it through these ages. They had many different names for it. The Japanese call it Zen. Uh, it was called Nirvana. It's called God consciousness. It's called Gnosis. Now, where did this all originate from? It's also been called the Philosopher's Stone. It ris- originated in the Garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge, the apple. You know, Lucifer said, if you eat of this apple, you will have knowledge between good and evil, and you will become like God. And that's the goal. They want people to think that they can become like a God, a God-man and a God-woman. Remember, 6 plus 7, 13. 6 being the number of man, 7 being the number of God. So you have this enlightenment, this knowledge. You can get it many different ways. You can open up your chakras many different ways. And the, 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 the Hindu knew about it through the Tantra. The Buddha knew about it. Timothy Leary knew about it from LSD. It, it uh, opens you up very quickly, but it shuts very quickly under LSD. 
There's many ways you can open up your chakras. And this spiritual enlightenment, you're going to see it come. It's already mainstream in America. But it's going to become everywhere. It's going to be just like the green movement. So the idea, to answer your question, is they're going to lead you down this path of deception that you can become like a god, just like they did in Atlantis. Because in Atlantis, if you read up Atlantis, the beings of Atlantis were enlightened, meaning they were self-aware, self-knowledge. And they only worshipped one person. They worshipped the statue of Poseidon. Now, let's think about this. When you think of Poseidon, he's got what in his hand? A pitchfork with three prongs. He is the sea king. He is the god of the sea. Think about this. Who else, who else holds a pitchfork? Who else has a reference in the Bible to being of the water, comes up out of the water, the beast out of the water? That's who they worshipped. That's where this is all heading. Yes, they want to control your life. Yes, they want to know what you're doing. Yes, they want to pay attention to make sure you're not going to descend to their plan. But ultimately, they don't want just your body. They want your soul. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think, like in the, uh, the original story of Atlantis, the old Atlantis, that mm -hmm. uh, you know how uh, in the story uh, – and I know it, it stops with Plato stops, you know, pretty abruptly. He says that they were heading to council pretty much, the gods with Zeus, because even Zeus, even though he was the king of the gods, he still had to hold council amongst them. And um, they all had to agree. And uh, he, uh, according to Plato, they were, you know, they were about to get together and discuss this. But Zeus wanted to pretty much, you know, reign his vengeance, which he was known for uh, in the old days. And if you read what people would now call Greek mythology, which again, I've talked about the, the ancient, the ancient cultures and everything. And I, I say, it's very arrogant for us to say the word mythology and act like it's a friggin' story when we don't know what the truth is because mainstream religion today misleads most people. And if we, I think if we want to find the truth about most of this stuff, we have to raid the Vatican archives. That's a start, you know, uh, throughout history, this this information about where we originate from and everything else, and, and the true stories of the, the mystery religions and all this other stuff, has been um, it, a lot of it's been destroyed. You know, they they burned the Library of Alexandria. Uh, they they that stuff wasn't by you know happenstance. People are like, oh, you know, they they were just idiots. They didn't know it was in there, and they just they just sacked it and burned it. No, they didn't. If you actually do your research, you'll see that, that that was done on purpose. They were told specifically to go in there and do that. And you know what? We did kind of the same thing when we sacked Iraq. The first thing we did was blew the doors off the National Museum and stole tablets that were 5,000 years old. And a statue of a reptilian female, humanoid, like reptoid humanoid female feeding a human baby. Let's get that out of the purview. Let's not talk about that. Why would they talk about that stuff five, 6,000 years ago? Let's debate it. Even if it's not physically real, why can't we have that debate? See, that's what I have a problem with. That's how you know that there's something to hide when they won't even let you have the friggin' debate about it. That's how you know there's something that, you know, obviously they don't want you to see. It would well, be smarter for them to let you talk about it and just get it out, and then people would be able to make their minds up, and that would be it. But no, they'd rather hide it. So... What's there? Yeah. Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is, it says when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that word? Sealed? Remember I told you, if you open yourself up in these other methods and ways, you are open. You are not sealed. So, you, you know, like that movie just came out about possession. I think it's one of the best movies in America right now, one of the highest grossing movies. That is what I'm talking about. You know, that if you're not sealed and protected under the blood of Christ, you are open to the deception of the demonic spirits, which are going to become more and more prevalent. Because remember, I told you this is a new pagan age. This is not a Christ age. This is a pagan age that's coming. So if you're not in tune and protected, you could be exposed to these elements that I'm talking about. Well, interestingly, like, I, I have my own thoughts on what demons and stuff really are. And okay. it's interesting, but it's interesting what, if you research science, even science is admitting that there's a different, there's a fourth dimension, that the third dimension yep. that we live in right now, that there's actually something else. So it makes you wonder if, if these demons of, you know, uh, what, you know, what religion or Christianity would call demons, or I don't want to say just regular religion, because I know, um, 
uh, Muslims call them something. They have a, a name for them. I forget what they're called, but they have pretty much the a name for like these demon creatures. These creatures are prevalent throughout all these cultures. So it makes you wonder, even if it's not religion, even if if they used you know mainstream religion or or the or the mainstream religion of that area as a way to cover what really happened, it makes you wonder what these things are. What exactly is this force? Where, you know, is it some sort of other entity? You know, are these different cultures that go back five, six thousand years that talk about, you know, things coming, you know, from outer space? And I don't mean aliens because I, I don't really want to call them aliens. I would, I would, especially with what we know about a fourth dimension in quantum physics, I would say maybe they're interdimensional, but who knows? You know what I mean? The, the point is there's obviously some higher force at work here, even if it's just you want to believe good versus evil. It's there. You know, when people say to me, you have to be careful of the New Age religions because that New Age stuff is just – that's a mind trap to catch everybody else that runs away from any you know, organized religion. That's a mind trap to get them wrapped up in that and, and, and pulled down into the, the mire and the muck to, and, and to not get them to, to see the, the reality of things. I don't the, – the, the New Age religions, I had somebody preach to me because uh, I, I was you know, researching them a couple of years ago. Uh, probably about eight, nine years ago now, and uh, somebody involved in them told me that uh, there is no evil, no such thing as evil. There just is. And I had an issue with that because I've seen evil in my own life. You know what I mean? I've seen what it looks like when it takes a physical manifestation in a human being in front of me. Right. And I've seen it. And I had this, I tried to have a debate about it with this person. And because I debated them in the fact that of what I, you know, look, I have experienced what true evil is, I've seen it. You know, and I've I've researched it. It exists. You know, and there's people that have experienced it way worse than I have. So trust me, I know that evil is out there. And these people couldn't. They they didn't want to see that. They were like, well, it just is. You know, blah blah blah. They pre-wrote that experience, and I don't. You know, I I don't buy into that. I'm not picking on anybody, but I just don't buy into the fact. You know, I don't buy into that. Again, new age religion stuff is. It, I, in my personal opinion, it's to trap the people that are breaking away from other mind prison thoughts, you know, types of thinking into looking into things on a grander scale. And it, I think it wraps them up into a nice little bow and ties them down. Chris, we're out of time. Thank you again for coming on my show. Really quick, give out your website again for the listeners. Okay, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, my website is uh, America's New World Order.com. Thanks for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Now you understand the basics of what it is that they're planning to do. Whether or not you believe in, in this stuff, these elitist douchebags do. That's the important thing. You have to understand what they're up to so we can defeat them and stop it and evolve to a higher level and you know get away from this war. We're out.